go to big some of these places like in New Jersey on the beaches. Well, the draft is over. I know yeah. the Eagles. You never know. It must have been crazy down there. <laughs> Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is hope. All the time. All the time. God is love. All the time. And every day. Welcome, my friends. Did you come with want to visit with you today? Do we have announcements? Isabel? Good morning. I, w I would like to thank everyone that's helped uh, with the homeless this week, whether it be um, donation, food, um, making meals, um, unlocking the doors, locking up. I really appreciate it. It makes it a little easier for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. Any more announcements? Lay representative, would you mind to ask the church for prayers for the Anna Conference and this week um, I'm going to be going down to the annual conference on Thursday and coming home on Saturday Pastor Anthony will be going also and I want to ask your prayers for traveling mercies and prayers for the the whole conference that everything goes good and um, everything gets taken care of that they want taken care of. So if you keep, please keep us all in your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. And it's going to be at, at Hashi. So if you don't get anything, you can get a lot of candies and chocolate. Come. It is okay for you to come for a few hours or so and watch the conference um, you don't have to be a member of conference to come and watch the um, decisions being made at conference. Please join us if you can. Any more announcement? Did I see your hand, Diane? No? All right. Uh, Pam? Um, on Friday, me and Ann and a whole bunch of us, Kathy and Sue and Jane, we had all packed up, and Joyce, we all packed up backpacks to take over to Head Start. We have increased from 25 to 36. And when we were delivered them on Friday, they were so pleased. They had said to tell everybody, thank you for their donations that it is really a program that is really helping these children. Great, great. Thank you so much for representing us. Any more announcements? Third Sunday following Easter, let us rise up and sing this beautiful hymn, In the Garden, 314 of United Methodist Hymnals. Please stand.
Please join me in the call to worship. Sisters and brothers, beware this morning. You might just meet Jesus. What is in Jesus? Jesus the reason we came to worship. Why should we be? If we truly meet Jesus, the blinders to poverty and the suffering may fall, and the groans of creation might be heard. If we pay attention, we may understand our privilege and recognize our advantages, and such knowledge would lead to change. We want to be transformed. Help us, O oh God, not to be concerned about meeting Jesus, but to be willing to celebrate the Emmanuel, God who lives in each of us as we worship you. Amen. So be it. Please be seated. Please join me in the invocation. O oh God, who has been our helper and our healer, you have been faithful all the days of our lives. Today we pray for help and healing for our world, even though the wealth of our planet and the liberation of our people rest upon people willing to change from their selfish and destructive ways. Let your power be greater than all the self-centered people of the world put together. That's why we have hope. So let us remember your mercy and prayer for the kingdom of God to reign on earth, even the parts that will challenge our comfortable lives. Amen. Let us continue in worship as we join our voices together with the prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Oh God, you know me better than I know myself, and sometimes that scares me. You know what I try to hide, what I try to deny. You know that I mean well, but when I dare to be honest, my intentions are not always in the best interest of others. Yet, however painful it may be, let me be open. Let me see the persecuted and oppressed in my city, the marginalized now nation, the exploited people of our world. Let me hear the words of Jesus. And let those words pierce the hardness of my heart. Let me see the face of Jesus in all the faces I don't want to see. By your grace, don't let me ignore your invitation to see in our homes and places of work. Brothers and sisters, friends, my friends, grace and forgiveness are real, but even so is accountability to the word of God. Grace and forgiveness are not excuses to avoid the kind of change that scripture requires of faithful disciples. is the hard but rare good news. Amen. Uh, Would you mind standing my friends and share the peace of God with one another? You can say the peace of God be with you or shalom. And having shared the peace of God with one another, having exchanged God's peace with each other, 
while returning to our seats, let us recognize the senior choir as the leaders in worship with the anthem, O oh Lord, how wonderful you are. The senior choir. wonderful you are. Let's give the choir another hand. God is wonderful, my friends. How wonderful was God with you last week? What areas of your life had been hopeful, joyful, wonderful last week? Yes, Joe? Uh, 
Indeed, I've seen her a few times. Uh, the adult Bible class is making arrangements if we can to visit Pastor Paul and maybe hold one Bible class in her room. We're hoping to do that by God's grace after the annual conference. So tell her we are thinking of her. Thank you, Joe, for your role you've played between us as a church and Betty Paul. Thank you. Did I see your hand? No? Just looking at me like... Any more joyful news of last week? Is that the only joy we have in the house? What about the challenging news? Is that better? My husband is not doing well, and he needs all the prayers that he can get. So I would thank anybody that will pray for him. Is he home? Yes, he is home, and he has a visiting nurse coming in every day. And of course, I do what I can. Definitely. Please assure him that we did not remove him from our prayer list. We will keep him on that list. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, Kathy? And we need uh, many continued prayers for Barb Yurko and, and for Vince. Yes, Barb. We understand she's back at Little Flower from the General Hospital. We will keep doing that. Are we ready to pray? Let us bow down our minds and our hearts to God in prayer. Lord, we keep listening to you, and you keep talking to us in sentences, in languages, in scripture that speaks more to our hearts than to our brains. We come, O oh God giving you thanks for all that you've been, all that you are, all that you promised to be. We are grateful, God, for the beautiful stories we've heard of healings among us and around us, of hopes, of celebrations done within us and among us. And for that, we are grateful. We give you thanks to God for all of our prayers answered and those yet to be answered. For promises fulfilled and those yet to be fulfilled, 
asking, O oh God, that you will be with us at moments when we doubt, at moments when we feel weak, at moments when we feel our hearts promises and hopes broken asking that you the porter we pick our broken pieces together we build and remold us into who you want us to be we pray for every name, every woman, every man raised in prayer today. We pray for the annual conference, the bishop, the pastors, and the lady. We pray for our denomination. God, you called us to be the church. We did not choose ourselves. You chose us and called us by name, called us as an institution to exist for you and serve in your name. We have been in places of controversy before. We've been in areas where we have disagreed with one another in years past. We have marched. We have spoken out. We have written for things that are just, things that are hopeful, and delightful to you. And we know that whenever we put all of our trust on your shoulder, you have never left the church alone. And so where we here we come, Lord, as the United Methodist Church worldwide, faced with another challenge. Another challenge that speaks to our own very existence. And yet we do know, oh God, that you who called us knew that we are not without difficulties. You did not call and create a church that is above and beyond obstacles. For the church is created with men and women who in many ways, in many directions are not perfect. But we do not doubt that you, the perfect God, is able to put together imperfect people. Create from among us what is hopeful, joyful, and abiding in your name. And so we come one more time saying, we do not go where to go and how to go. But we do know that we are not the creator of the church you are. We give our disagreements back to you. We return our obstacles to you, O oh God. We bring onto your own shoulder a burden too difficult for us to carry. Do not abandon us, O oh God. You never did. You never will. And so this day we pray for the annual conference and the United Methodist Church as a denomination. And only that we pray for Firewood Church. 
or our contribution in faith is needed for the whole church. We are little but great before you, creating us, O oh God, men and women, who we pray endlessly for this church. This church we receive from you through our forefathers and mothers, giving us the courage and the strength, even the ability to hold it together. Finally, God, we pray for the individual man and woman who came to this worship with a need so heavy, so private, that only you would know about it. We ask that you return peace, the peace of mind that the world cannot provide to anyone among us who is seeking for one. We ask for your healing, for your support, for your fellowship with every man, every woman needing one. And finally, God, we close the prayer with the prayer you taught us. Whenever we gather together, whenever we pray together, simply to raise up our voices together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, and that as it is in heaven. This morning's uh, responsive reading is Psalm 116, found on your hymnal, your pew, by, your pew hymnals, 837. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and my supplications, and has inclined his ears to me whenever I called. The snares of the death encompass me, the rings of Sheol laid on me, I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord is brought low. The Lord saves me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. The Lord has dealt bountiful with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, all What shall I return to the Lord for all my benefits? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord the death of his fit form. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have loosened my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in our midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. I'm reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 14a and 36 to 41. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, 
this Jesus whom you crucified. No, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and raised and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. From the promises for you, for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Please stand if you are able. Now on the same day, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with, with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, then one of them whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He said to them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since the, these things took place. Moreover, some women of a group atoned us they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his, his body they, there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer thing, these things and then enter into, the, into his glory? Then beginning, with, then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them, interpreted to them the, things that, the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they, had, they were going, he walked ahead if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day, and the day is near, now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he, was, when he was at the table with them, he looked. He took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they, they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. 
Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. At the back of your United Methodist hymn knows. Selection 888. Eight. And let us responsibly use the words of St. Paul to the church in Corinth and Colossae. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news which we've received in which we stand and by which we are saved. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldest die for me? Let us sing the first and the last stanzas of 363. 363, the first and the last. Lord, 
Lord our God, we give you thanks for this day that we took who claim the resurrected Christ as having died and raised for even me. Encourage our minds, O oh God, to listen to an interpretation of your word that we may grow a little taller, a little more informed of your love for each and for all of us. This day and every day, in God's name we pray. Amen. Friends, let us think around the topic from broken hearts to joyful hearts. Remember the ladies, the women, we are the first that went to the empty grave. They found the grave empty. Were they happy? No. They were so sad that this Jewish group of people did not only hate Jesus when he was alive, but hated him even more after death. That among the Jews who paid so much respect to the dead, they would do anything and everything to preserve the dead. In fact, even to this day, if an accident occurred in Jerusalem or in any of the cities in Israel, and literally, if people are cut into pieces, remember sometimes um, more bombers will go to blow themselves up, suicide bombers, and when they do that, they blow up literally people into pieces. You want to see how the Jewish believers we take their time to pick up every little bit of bone or flesh. That's because they so honor the dead. Remember Jesus saying leave the dead to bury their dead. And that's because the dead will be buried a second time after putting together all of the bones and taking somewhere else forever. So the Jews paid a lot of respect to human beings, especially when they die. And so when these women went to the grave and discovered that the body was not there, they thought that the enemies of Jesus had decided to not only destroy him alive, but to do so much disrespect to his body by taking him, the dead body, from that grave to wherever they want, so they will continue disrespecting that cause. I mean, many um, cultures might not really yeah, so much once somebody is dead, but not the Jews at all. That is why those ladies we are the most sorrowful the day of the resurrection than anybody else in the early church. They said, Wow, the Jews so hate Jesus. I did not only kill him so brutally, but I even willing and ready to come and take his body. And who knows what they have done with him? That's why Mary of Magdala was so sorrowful. That was the most sorrowful day in the life of the early church. That the body of Jesus was not found. They really wanted the body to stay in the grave. But if the body of Jesus had stayed in the grave, my friends, that would have changed the whole concept of Christianity. Our concept in life after death would have been completely blown into pieces. That's why these women we are so, so heartbroken. Not only that, 
most of the men who ran away the day before even had so much more sorrow in their hearts because the guy for whom they left their homes and wives and professions like fishermen or tax collectors, the guy for whom they gave their life was not only destroying death, but even after death, they can't even have the decency of having a grave for him. He was not there. Nobody knew where his body was. Would you be happy if you were to bury your best of friends and you go over there and he is not in the grave? Even today, we would be very, very upset with that. These ladies and the men, we are not only upset, they were very heartbroken. Well, when did the, the change of heart come about? It came about when they saw an angel saying to them, Why are you wasting your time here? Did he not tell you that he will rise up? Indeed, he has risen up. He is not here. He does not belong here. He does not belong to a grave. Instantly, their sorrow became joy. But that joy was not complete because there were still some among them who were scientists. Scientists to their own days, one who wants to believe something only after seeing it for themselves, proving it for themselves. And that was who Thomas was. How come you and I are so, so judgmental of unbelieving Thomas? We even give him the preface to his name, the unbelieving Thomas. Would you have believed yourself? If you had been with somebody, someone who is not of the best educated, who was not rich at all, did not have any mortgage to pay, did not marry, had no children, had no bank accounts, and this guy dying like that, would you, would you not have been so sorrowful that you gave so much for nothing? That is why, where they were. From broken hearts to joyful hearts. My friend, the church, the early church, was not a place of hope and joy as we, we expect it today. No, these were people who had left everything and the guy for whom they gave all of their lives is not only killed, but even in his body they cannot see. In Africa, if you die as a good man, the best we can do for you is to have your grave in a place where others will come and see over and over again. Before, because before the colonial masters, except the Zulus and the Kosas, not many African cultures wrote their stories. What they did, like the Jewish people did, was they remembered things. And the way you remember things is if you have a grave to show to the generations to come, here is the grave of this guy. We know he was there. This is what he did. This is how much he did not do. But without a grave in Africa, that is not only insulting, a graveless man, a graveless woman in many African cultures is the result of somebody who was no good in the society at all. Did you hear that? If you die in many African cultures without having been good at all, they would not bury you where you will be remembered. That is the greatest insult of not having the body. Thank God. In an instant, the angel came and said, no, no, he's not here. He was not supposed to be in the grave. I was pastoring a church in, in Philadelphia in 1996. And I was doing a Bible study group like I always do. And I was an, an older woman who came to that study all the time. And one day she came, became so upset with something. She said, I know 
Jesus will be turning around in his grave. Why are you laughing? I know Jesus will be turning around in his grave. What is wrong with that statement? I said, well, if Jesus we are really turning around in his grave, then there is no need for this church to be here. Jesus is not in his grave, and that's the reason for the existence of the church. We have an empty grave. So from sadness, the women got a heart that was full of joy. My friends, our day and times are full in many instances of joylessness. We live in a society today where there is so much more to give us broken heart than joyful heart. There are so many young people taking their own lives because they don't think there is any reason for them to be alive. And if anybody dies in our parish, in our streets, in our societies as Christians, somehow, without being feel, feeling guilty, without accusing you of having done, committed any crime, I'm saying because of our faith, whenever somebody kills himself or herself, because he or she does not find any reason to live and be alive, you and I have failed. Did you hear me? Whenever we hear young people who have all of their lives ahead of them kill themselves for one reason or the other, the church has every reason to be guilty. Yet, there are millions of people in the world, whole world today who go around with broken hearts. Not much is happening in their lives. They've got lost jobs. Many of them do not have insurances. The insurance they have is not good enough. They can't buy that much. Many of them, I mean, you and I know that um, Isabel is representing us in receiving people here for two weeks. People who are American citizens and people who have every light, right like you and me to have a home, a joyful home, a place they can come back to at the end of the day. Yet, none of those who are here these last two weeks have any home of their own. In a culture, in a country that is the richest in the world, you ask me, yes, this is the richest nation God has ever blessed. And yet, among us, there are broken hearts to the point that they cannot even call a place a home. Not only that, the basic necessity for human life and living is food. Food to be able to eat. Since God feeds even the raven, the birds of the air, are fed. God feeds the mice, feeds the ants. But we cannot feed each other. Among us is this tragedy of having many of us go to bed hungry. One day I called the SPRC chair. I said, I'm finding it difficult to sleep. And I think she's here listening to me. I said, why? As I went to visit this man who are here for two weeks without a home, without warmth, and I came back, I can't sleep because here I am in a whole personage just by myself in the richest nation on earth in the denomination that believes that all men and women are created equal. My friends, we have broken hearts all over the place. And it is not good enough to just pray about it. What we can do on the third Sunday of Easter is for each of us to take a moment. 
to say to ourselves, God, how much have you given me? How much of what you've given me are you giving me the courage to share? Because most times we are afraid of sharing because we think if we share, we will get poor. The more we share, the poorer we are. But the Bible says the opposite, right? The Bible says it is what? Better to give than to receive. Is the Bible wrong? My friends, I don't want to let you feel guilty. But I'm just assuring you that the gospel is about a man who died and rose again. Making sure that those moments when his followers were telling him, Jesus, you have spoken to 5,000 men for these hours. They are tired, they are hungry, they are homeless. Let us send them away to take care of themselves. Jesus said no. He went against everything those men told him to do. Then uh, the men said, if you are going to keep them here, there is not much here to feed them. How many did they have there? Five loaves and two fish. How can we share five loaves and two fish to 5,000 men? And the biblical writer corrected himself saying, the 5,000 number I gave you is only of men. It does not include women, nor does it include children. So if we were to include women and children in that number, maybe it could have been something like 15,000 people. Yet, Jesus chose not to send them to take care of themselves. Rather, he told the same apostles, let them sit down. Let us send them their way. Provide a place for them to sit. And they sat. And then he took what they had. Not what they came from Germany or from others. He used what they had. And prayed on it. And blessed it. And because he used what he had, prayed on it, asked for God's blessing on what he had. God blessed it in such a way that he multiplied it to be able to, to feed more than 15,000 people. And the story goes that they did not throw away the remnant. In the United States, if you go to these five food places, what they said to us today, they should not keep tomorrow, right? They should throw it away. Now multiply the number of fast food places all over the country. See so how much food we throw away every day. When people come to us without homes, without food, friends, you and I have a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. You see, there is a man called Jeremiah. He used to preach like me. But unlike me, he used to cry a lot. Jeremiah, in chapter 14, 22, I don't know whether my friend is following me to put that for you. If, if, if uh, Bill is following me, Jeremiah 8, 22 says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Is there no hope in America? Is there no care in, the, in this country that people to go to bed hungry without enough insurance? Is that not care enough? I say to you, my friends, in your life, try changing that statement, that verse. It is a question, is it not? Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Turn it from a question mark to an exclamation mark. You know the, dif the difference? Yeah, we have teachers here like uh, um, Joe, must be following me. 
to change an exclamation mark, uh, a, a question mark into an exclamation mark means a whole lot. It means saying, instead of asking, is there no bomb in Gilead? The statement should then be, there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a physician there. There and only then are we able to turn that question mark into an exclamation mark. In your home, in your place of work, turn so many stories, so many questions of need into exclamation marks of hope. And you will not be alone. God will be with you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the people of God will say, Amen. Let's be willing to be in the mode of giving. For to me and to you, God has given so much. Please stand. assurance of God that the more we give the more we are blessed and just by giving all does not mean that we become poor bless the offerings we bring now God that we become a blessing not only to ourselves but to all in need everywhere in your precious name we pray Amen if you are able remain standing and let's sing the first the last stanzas of this beautiful hymn of courage and comfort, heroes. 316, let's sing the first and the last stanzas. He crucified my Savior. And led him to the tree. They crucified my Savior. And led him to the tree. They crucified my Savior. And led him to the tree. And I'll hold him there. I'll sing it He rose. He rose. He rose from the dead. He rose, he rose, he rose from the dead. He rose, he rose, he rose, he rose from the dead. And an angel came from heaven.
If you don't mind, hold each other's hand as we receive the benediction. My friends, because he rose, you too will rise up, not only from the dead, but from every challenge you face every day. Because he rose, you too shall rise up from every fall, every disappointment, every illness. And may you have your trust and faith not in yourself, but in God who rose so that you too shall rise. In the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the people of God, we say, Amen. Would you be seated for the post, Lord? Thank you. 